You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. It was a clear, brisk spring day in Woodstock, Ontario. A Wednesday, a day like many others that had come and were expected to still be in the future. An eight-year-old girl was on her way home from school to her brand new house where she lived with her mom, Tara, and her brother, Darren. She had just started the painstaking process of getting her room together just how she wanted it the night before. She had decorated the room with posters and toys that showed off her true loves in life. Disney princesses, Bratz dolls, and high school musical. That evening, she was going to spend the evening with her dad, Rodney, and then watch a movie with some of her friends. Unfortunately, though, those plans were not going to be fulfilled as every parent's worst nightmare came true on April 8, 2009. Hello, and welcome to Gone But Never Forgotten, The Kidnapping and Murder of Tori Stafford. Goners and welcome back to GBNF. As this episode goes live, our family is preparing for our vacation up in northern Ontario as we hope to enjoy a peaceful, relaxing, and awe-inspiring vacation. Our son has become fascinated with geography and as such he developed an interest for the Great Lakes. Last year we were lucky enough to travel with friends of ours to Pelee Island on Lake Erie And this year, we're headed up to the northern shores of Lake Superior. I cannot stress enough, if you get the chance to explore Canada at any point in your life, you should certainly do so. If you live here, the beauty within the boundaries of this country are amazing. And if you don't live here, coming to visit should be on your bucket list. Are you excited for our trip, Julie? I'm more than excited. I think... You know, this whole year has been, like, long, and the summer has been so hot, so I think it's going to be really awesome to just go up north and be away from this heat for a little bit. Um, Not only that, I'm excited to be around nature and forest and water and just really relax this summer. Yeah, I mean, I can't wait. It's kind of, it's going to be awesome to go somewhere that's, like, 10 to 15 degrees cooler than where we are now, like, sweater weather in the summer, I'm sorry, but, like... That turns me on. (laughs) It's going to be a good time. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's something about small towns that's so comforting. You know, like just you and then like a couple thousand people, that's it. Nothing crazy, you know. So I think it's going to be great for us and I look forward to exploring more of Canada. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. One thing I did want to mention too before we dive right into the case is that we actually did add a new piece of merch on our merch store. If you've been listening, we put up new merch with our Be Better motto on it, and of course, in smaller type, the name of the podcast. So, if you like our stance on being better, please help us out and go grab a shirt. Yes. Uh, Another thing I'm super excited about, because mine is on the way. You can, of course, also help us out by becoming a patron on patreon.com or by sending in one-time PayPal donations to the show. Thank you for helping out if you can and when you can. But I think that's enough chatter for one day. Let's talk about that passion that makes the heart burn and the stomach churn. True crime. The time after a relational breakup is never an easy time for children. The Stafford family had just gone through their own breakup recently And part of that fallout was that young 8-year-old Victoria Stafford, her brother, 10-year-old Darren Stafford, 
and their mom, Tara, had all just moved into a new home together around the 1st of April 2009 in Woodstock, Ontario. As the new routines and new life started, the plan on April 8th was for Darren to walk Tori home from Oliver Stevens Public School because this was their first time walking from the new school to the new house. When Darren got out of school around 3.30 p.m., he quickly walked a couple of other young children home while he was waiting for his sister. These other children lived right across the street from the school. When Darren came back to the school to pick up Tori, though, he didn't see her anywhere. After waiting for a while, he believed that she must have gone on without him and walked home. So Darren walked home. Only when he got home, he found out that Tori was not there either. Darren immediately grabbed his bike and went back out to look for Tori. He couldn't find her anywhere, though. The maternal grandma to the children started to make phone calls in earnest. She started to call all of Tori's friends in hopes that she had simply gone to someone else's house, but unfortunately that search and those calls came up empty. Tori was not with any of her friends. At 6.04 p.m., the police were called and Tori was reported as missing. Immediately, friends, family, and people in the community jumped to action. People were looking for Tori everywhere, and two things would quickly start to drive the narrative as the investigation was in its infancy. The first thing was that people noticed that Tori's mom, Tara McDonald, seemed suspicious. There are those judgmental eyes again that we've talked about in the past. All of the sleuths and the general public is always going to churn and come up with stories. Unfortunately, people believed that Tara was an easy suspect because of what they knew and what they heard. They had heard that Tara did not call the police or make calls to try and locate Tori. Instead, her mother had. They also were acutely aware of the fact that Tara was not out looking for Tori. Word also spread quickly that Tara was unemployed and had drug issues. Needless to say, the early rumblings that drove public narrative was that Tara likely must have had something to do with the disappearance of Tori. I've said it before, we see it so often. The general public starts to go after someone in a case and they think they have proof that they did something and bad things can happen. And there are many times where someone has hurt themselves, or worse, only to have their name cleared later on. There was a situation like that that we mentioned in the episodes on Luca Magnata. A young man took his life because he was harassed so badly. The second thing that came up relatively quickly was video footage. A high school that was close by Oliver Stevens Public School had surveillance footage of the area between the schools and the cameras had picked something up. Tori was seen walking around 3.32 p.m. with a woman. The video footage was not clear and the face of the woman was not discernible, but people began to believe that the woman in the video was Tori's mom, Tara, and that perhaps that was why she hadn't been looking for Tori and the reason that she had not called the police herself. The police released the video and asked for the public's assistance in identifying the woman in question, and the question became, who is the woman in the puffy white jacket? That woman from CCTV was wearing a white puffy jacket, and she was believed to be the obvious key in discovering what happened to Tori. Police said that they believed that the woman that was walking across the schoolyard with Tori was known to Tori, which they believed was based on the body language and what they could see. It appeared that Tori was going with the woman very willingly. Police also said that they did not believe that this was a case of foul play. This blew my mind then, and it still blows my mind now. How can you have footage of a girl with a woman, and that girl has not been seen since? and then say it's not foul play. The literal definition of foul play is unlawful, dishonest behavior. I assume that maybe you could assume that for a couple of hours. Maybe Tori was just with someone and they forgot to tell mom or something like that. But almost a week later, the narrative still was that they didn't believe that this was foul play. What could be deciphered from the video was this. The woman had straight, dark hair, she had on dark trousers, 
a white puffy jacket, and a bag slung over one shoulder. She was described as white, 19 to 25 years of age, approximately 5'2", and she weighed between 120 and 125 pounds. The public was furious, however, many of them fearing the worst. Further dismay came on April 13th when police announced that they were calling off their ground search for Tory Stafford. Friends and family were literally beside themselves. It seemed that police had decided that Tory was not in harm's way, or, at the very least, was not going to be found. The ground searches by the public, though, continued. Police were certainly not completely out of their depths to believe this, though. As mentioned, Tori did appear to willingly be walking with the woman, and the reality is, in Canada, in 2021, for example, there were 28,033 reports of missing children. Of those cases, only 18 of those cases were deemed as stranger abduction cases. That is 0.0007%. In Canada, stranger abduction cases are extremely uncommon. Four days after Tori was reported missing, a woman who fit all of those characteristics had been arrested by police on an unrelated warrant on April 12, 2009. The woman in question's name was Terry Lynn McClintock. Police obviously noted the striking resemblance between Terry Lynn and the woman in the video, but she would deny that she had anything to do with Tori's disappearance. Spoiler alert if you're new to the case, but keep this woman on your mind for later. Over time, searches would ramp back up by police and searches by family and the public also continued. Ponds in the area were searched multiple times by civilians and dive teams alike, but nobody found Tori or any evidence even of what had happened to her. Hope, though, seemed to mostly stay alive that Tori would be found or returned alive, but obviously as more time went on, hope started to wane. On April 22nd, police would release a composite sketch of the woman from the video. Then, on April 25th, Tori's story would be on the acclaimed show America's Most Wanted. At the end of April, rewards were off offered up by the police and by a mystery person. The Oxford Community Police Service offered up a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person or people responsible. And the mystery person offered up essentially a blank check saying that they would pay any amount of money for Tori's safe return. Tara would say that the donor was someone who had also lost a child. She said that this anonymous person had listened to police when they told them not to pay ransom money and they lost their child. The mystery donor wanted to ensure that the same thing did not happen in Tori's situation. Police would also release footage of a vehicle of interest in the case, stating that they did not think that this was a suspect, but rather that they hoped that this was a witness that could provide assistance with the case. So anyways, you remember Terry Lynn McClintock? Of course. Well, over a month after she denied knowing about Tori or having anything to do with Tori's disappearance, her story changed. As if she suddenly was awash with clarity, she told police that she in fact did know what happened to Tori. She told police that she was there, outside of the school, on the day that Tori went missing, and she was not alone. She was with her boyfriend, Michael Rafferty. Terry Lynn went on to tell police that she knew that Tori was dead. She told police that Michael had raped Tori and then killed her. On May 20th, 2009, Michael Thomas Christopher Stephen Rafferty, age 28, was charged with first-degree murder. Terry Lynn McClintock, age 18, was charged with being an accessory to murder in the abduction and now suspected murder of Tori Stafford. News quickly broke also that police believed that Tara and Terry Lynn were familiar to one another. That would in fact later to be found to be true. The two women knew one another because they had previously been in contact about breeding their dogs, which will be pertinent later. Even though the arrests were made and police believed that Tori was indeed dead, family continued to hold out hope that the police were wrong. How could you not hold out that hope for as long as possible? I honestly can't even imagine. 
Michael, for his part, denied having anything to do with Tori's disappearance, even though he went through hours of interviews and interrogations. But Terry, on the other hand, decided to cooperate. I'm going to pause here for a moment just to give an extra layer of caution for the next part. We're going to discuss a very graphic description of what Terry Lynn said occurred. Listener discretion is again advised. Terry said that she and Michael had talked about abducting children at various times in the past, and on the morning of April 8th, he pushed her and taunted her and broke her will down so that she would do it with him. Michael had told her that he wanted a younger girl because they were, quote, easier to manipulate, unquote. So they drove to the school, and that is when they found Tori. Terry said that she went to Tori and lured her by saying that she wanted to show her a puppy. It was later stated by Tara that she didn't believe that Terry Lynn would have known that Tori was even her daughter, even though there would seem to be a link with the dog story here. She put Tori into the back seat of the car, and then Michael and her had driven away with Tori. Terry said that she then went to a local hardware store and she bought a claw hammer and some garbage bags. She said that the three then drove to a remote location that was near Mount Forest, Ontario, which was about 130 kilometers away. Once they arrived at the remote location, Terry said that she got out of the car while Michael was sexually assaulting Tori. She said that Michael then placed a garbage bag over her head and hit her with the hammer. Once Tori was dead, Terry said that they placed the body into more garbage bags, hid it under a pile of rocks, and drove away. Terry said that they had the car washed, got rid of their clothing and the hammer, and then moved on with their lives. On May 28, 2009, Terry Lynn's charges were altered to a first-degree murder charge and an unlawful confinement charge. Michael was charged with first-degree murder, sexual assault causing bodily harm, and kidnapping. Absolutely disgusting human beings. I don't care if you're the lead in a situation like this or the follower. You're equally at fault and equally deserve to face the full extent of the law. Of course, oftentimes that does not happen because of what happened next. Terry agreed that she would take a plea deal, which means a lesser charge and a lesser sentence usually. In return, she would testify against Michael at his trial. Terry Lynn would try, on multiple occasions, to lead police to the area where she said that Tori's body would be found. Tara was very vocal about this, and she said that she believed that Terry was doing everything for the attention and for the fresh air and helicopter rides, because she believed that Terry didn't know where the body was. On July 21st, 2009, over three months after Tori had gone missing, the unthinkable was unfortunately confirmed. Police announced that the remains that they had uncovered near Mount Forest just two days earlier were in fact the remains of Tori Stafford. Stafford's body was found naked from the waist down. She was left wearing only a Hannah Montana shirt and a pair of butterfly earrings. During her autopsy, it was determined that she had suffered a beating that caused lacerations to her liver and 16 broken ribs. Her cause of death was as a direct result of repeated blows to the head with a claw hammer. My god, how does a person do something like that to anyone, much less a child? These types of people are not people. They're just monsters. There is literally nobody out there that can do things like this and that is also normal, so to speak. I also want to take a moment to say that if you and your partner even joke about kidnapping or killing someone, you should probably report that and get the hell away from them. Warning signs aplenty. Terry Lynn was scheduled to make an appearance in court on April 30th, 2010, but a publication ban was imposed by the judge on everything that took place in court that day. The publication ban would be lifted on December 9th, 2010, and that would reveal that Terry Lynn had pled guilty to first-degree murder. She had been sentenced to life in prison and was being held at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario. March 5, 2012 was the date that Michael's trial started. 
Terry Lynn was to be the star witness for the trial, and she did not disappoint. She dropped a bombshell at the trial that was seemingly a shock to everyone, including police. Terry would say that she returned to the car having heard Michael rape Tori, and she was in a fit of rage because she was remembering her own childhood and her own situations and all of the hatred that she had for herself, and it all came out at once. And she was in fact the person who had struck the hammer blows that ultimately killed Tori. Michael's defense at trial would center around the fact that he was not the driving force behind what happened that day, but rather that Terry Lynn was. He said that she was the one that wanted to kidnap and kill a little girl and that he had been forced every step of the way. He said that when they arrived at the remote location, she told Michael to leave because Tori was afraid of him. He also said that he did not rape Tori, and in fact, that all he had done was help clean up the mess after the murder. Of course. Why wouldn't you try that defense at this point, right? I mean, Terry Lynn was already in jail for a life sentence. Might as well try to get her to shoulder all of the blame if you can. It's interesting how often in cases like this where you have two people working together, one of them turns on the other. Who knew that partners in murder could not be trusted to follow simple rules? Am I right? On April 11, 2012, over a year after Tori was kidnapped and murdered, the jurors returned to the courtroom at 9.18 p.m. and they found Michael Rafferty guilty on all charges. Four days or later, he would be sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years. He was given 10 years each for kidnapping and sexual assault, but those years would be served concurrently. As we try to do most of the time here, we aren't going to go into too much detail about the ins and outs of the two murderers in this case. But we will tell you that Michael Rafferty did try to appeal his conviction. He said that he was appealing because the judge's instruction to the jury were flawed. On June 10th, 2013, Rafferty appeared via video link and made his bid for an appeal. He was told that he would not be given legal aid for this appeal. His appeal was finally heard three years later on October 24th, 2016. And within the very same day, his appeal was dismissed and his sentencing was upheld. Both have been in and out of the news over the years for things that have happened within the walls of the prison and things that have happened outside of those walls. Perhaps the most notorious of those times I do actually want to talk about. In 2018, news broke that Terry had been transferred from prison to a healing lodge, which is a very significant change. She had been transferred to the Okima OC Healing Lodge in Saskatchewan, which is a site that is run by Service Canada. The lodge is described as having minimum to medium security and is an unfenced site. Inmates there are able to live with their children and they attend the lodge to attain cultural and spiritual training. Another big difference was the quote-unquote prison cell. At the Healing Lodge, their cell is a unit that has a bedroom, a bathroom, a living room, an eating area, and even a kitchenette. News would break because Rodney, Tori's father, let people know that they had been notified by Service Canada that Terry Lynn was making this move. The family was absolutely beside themselves as they could not understand how Terry Lynn was being transferred from a maximum security prison to this lodge. As you can imagine, the family was not the only people that were upset by this news, and many people mobilized marches and signed petitions to have this move overturned. Yeah, like, this is kind of crazy because I didn't even know that this was a thing in Canada, to be honest. What is really crazy about this, to me at least, is that I would love to go to this kind of thing. I want to go to a healing lodge and experience all of these things that Terry Lynn was getting during her sentence. But you know what? I can't afford to go to a place like this. But my tax dollars made it possible for a convicted child killer to go there. This is the kind of shit that gets me angry. I'm sorry. I don't care if you're aboriginal or you aren't. If you have been convicted of killing a child and are serving a sentence for that, you should unequivocally not be going to a healing lodge while you are to be behind bars. 
Conservative MP Candace Bergen brought a motion before Parliament in Ottawa to condemn and overturn the decision to have Terry Lynn move to the lodge. Her motion actually caused a day of debate in Commons and was eventually defeated 200 to 82 with all of the Liberal MPs voting against the motion. When I read that too, it honestly just pissed me off even more. I don't see any reason that anyone would think that this is all right. I don't even believe that all of these Liberal MPs believe that this should have been voted down. I think that more than anything, this shows you the ways that politicians play games across party lines. It's petty and it's downright ridiculous. They voted against this because a Conservative brought the motion before Parliament. Do you know how I know that's a fact? No, but I bet you're going to tell us. You better believe it. Thankfully, Terry Lynn is not living at a healing lodge anymore. She's back behind bars in prison where she belongs. The general public and the outcry about this got loud. So, guess what the Liberals did? Minister of Public Safety Ralph Goodall issued an order for the Correctional Services Canada to look at the decision to move Terry Lynn and the policy itself in general. So, the Liberals managed to take credit for it in the end. Wonderful. I'm so glad that these games are part of my country's government. You're right. It really is absurd. On November 7th, Goodall announced that Terry Lynn was returning to federal prison and he said that things would be changed and transfers would be made much stricter. As far as we know, she is still at the Edmonton Institution for Women prison. Oh, but Terry Lynn wasn't done there. She tried to seek compensation for her mistreatment regarding the transfer and transfer back. Oy vey, this friggin' woman. Criminals. You know, some of these asshats really are something else. She wanted to be paid for her short vacation to a healing lodge. Thankfully, that matter was dropped. As for Michael, he was moved in December 2018 to La Macaza Institution, a medium security prison in Quebec. He was also since been accused of extorting money from his mother. So he also continues to be a winner. Listen... I don't know where to go with the end of this episode, but these two honestly just make me sick. Obviously, they make me sick for the things that they did to this precious little girl, but even all of the stuff after. This woman had the gall to believe that she deserved, and I should add that it's been argued by her own family that she's not even Aboriginal. She believed that she deserved to be treated much differently at that healing lodge. I think that counts as not having remorse for what you've done. And Michael, this guy is just a sick, disgusting criminal through and through. They're both where they deserve to be, and they both deserve extended stays. Is there anything else that you want to say about all this? I think you literally hit the nail on the head there. Like, these two people are just sick, and they're monsters, and it's it's so... It's almost worse that they did this together because, like, had Michael gone up to Tori, she might not have went. But, like, probably because it was a woman, it was a dog, like, it was very comfortable, you know. So I just think it's just so sick and it's very disgusting and stomach-churning when you think that this was perfectly planned out this way. And even the way that they killed her was just terrible, you know. Like, this wasn't just a, like, oh, let's get a kid and, like, quick killing or whatever. Like, this sounds absolutely terrible. So, I don't know. I hate everything about this episode. I feel absolutely terrible for this little girl and her family. And I'm glad that those people are in jail. And I'm glad that Terry Lynn uh, didn't get to stay at the healing lodge. Because, in my opinion, she doesn't deserve anything. You know, if anything, she actually deserves the worst of the worst, to be honest with you. Yeah. So that's where I stand. And I just think it's totally wrong. And I think uh, this is one of those cases where I'm actually happy that the government saw that something was not right with how she was being dealt with. Yeah, for sure. I agree. The reality is this. <clears throat> April 8, 2009, a little girl, Tori, woke up and she got herself excitedly ready for school. She was looking forward to school. She was looking forward to her friends and spending time with her dad that night. And then she was approached by someone that took full advantage of her youthful innocence and offered to show her a dog. So 
Tori went with her. And then Tori fell victim to something that we told you in this episode is very unlikely. She was kidnapped, raped, and murdered by two people who were essentially complete strangers. So don't laugh when you say stranger danger and teach your kids about stranger danger. Sure, it's unusual, but it happens. Make sure that your kids grow up knowing that sadly there are times when we cannot expect the best out of everyone because there are monsters living among us. Take this story to heart and have that silly chat with your kids again today. Just so you know that they're aware that this could happen. Ensure that stories like this continue to be uncommon and ensure that we all do our part to be better and make the world around us better. Okay, so that was a great episode. I'm glad we dealt with it. But let's take it down a bunch of notches, shall we? Yeah, that sounds like a wonderful idea to me. Let's tell our wonderful listeners about our first hashtag, Be Better story. I'm super excited. For those of you that don't know, we asked on social media for our listeners to send us emails or DMs that tell us about something that they or someone that they know did or went through, and it made the world around them a better place. Well, we're excited to say we got our first email. Go ahead, Julie. Monique wrote us an email, and I am assuming that she is either from Barrie or was visiting Barrie because her story happened at Kempenfest, which is a festival in Barrie. Monique said a friend of mine was at Kempenfest this past weekend, and she had a lot of money in a small backpack that she had with her. She put her backpack down to go on a ride, and then she forgot it afterwards. Well, someone actually found the bag and returned it to her with all of the money still intact. Hashtag be better. I love this story so much. This is something that I hate to say. I believe it's uncommon in today's world. Usually that story would turn into the bag was returned with no money or something like that. This makes me happy. I can't imagine the level of stress and then the level of relief. Thank you so much, Monique, for sharing us this story. And thank you so much for bringing a light on positive things that are happening in Barrie. So if you want to potentially have your story shared on the podcast, Email us at gbnfpod at gmail.com or hit us up on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, or Facebook and drop us a line. It can be short or longer than Monique's, but just not too long. We'll try to choose one or maybe two for every episode as they come in to us. Tell us what you see in the world around you and let's find different ways that people can hashtag be better. Thanks for listening to GBNF, and as always, we will see you next week.